Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this AVB presentation. Uh, my name is Germain Simon. I'm a product manager at L Acoustics, and I'm with Etienne Cortel today, uh, who is a master of uh, the technicity of AVB in Milan. Hello, Etienne. Hi. Uh, so my name uh, is uh, Etienne Cortel. I'm director of education and scientific outreach at uh, L Acoustics, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I let the floor to Germain to uh, start this uh, interesting, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Etienne. Um, again, welcome everyone to this AVB and Milan presentation. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, topics that are important for us in our everyday job. Um, the AVB in Milan uh, may not seem uh, like it at, at first when we talk about it, but it actually is a matter of um, making your life simpler. Uh, in deploying systems through audio network. So um, right now, as it stands, our systems are getting more and more complex. Uh, we're not solely loudspeaker manufacturers anymore, but we are manufacturers of a full ecosystem of products that talk to each other and that interact with each other. These systems need to have a certain path for the control and another path for audio. But this needs to be deployed in a very uh, simple manner and a very efficient manner. So following the, these two paths, the control of the audio is, uh, brings different difficulties. The audio distribution is a crucial aspect in our industry. Live concerns, uh, live concerts are built up and taken down within within a day, uh, it could be less than a day sometimes, the time that it takes to build up the system is shortened way more than it used to be. So things need to get uh, working extremely fast uh, and possibly with a minimum of effort. Um, and yet uh, these systems, as I say, are getting larger and larger and thus many more, um, uh, many more devices need to be installed and need to be connected to each other. And sometimes through distances uh, of more than 100 meters. So this makes quite of a crucial aspect in terms of sending audio from one device to another. Obviously, we want it to be without any audible degradation. We want it to be as safe, as secured, and as highest quality as possible. High quality means uh, no, dro no dropout. It means that we don't want any moment of silence, any awkward moment where you need to uh, find out what happened, replug anything. We don't want that. Uh, high quality means an extended frequency range. It's something that we are able to maintain today, uh, but it's something that we really need to keep in mind when designing uh, ecosystems of products like that. Um, without any audible degradation or high quality also means that we need a high dynamic range and it's specifically a low signal, a high signal to noise ratio. It means that we need to minimize the amount of noise that is uh, induced into the systems, into the network, into uh, the audio path between devices. And another extremely crucial aspect is the timing accuracy among different devices over the network. We need that audio is distributed at a specific time, at a very, very precise time. And we need to know when, where, but also in uh, that every single device in the network receive it and will be able to play what needs to be played at exactly the same time. And we'll see that all these uh, crucial aspects will be uh, uh, described in, in technical words when Etienne will describe the AVB uh, pr uh, protocols. On the other end is the control distribution. The control distribution is uh, also an important aspect of uh, our network, but it's something that has been, uh, uh, let's say, centralized uh, we, we don't use the front panels interfaces anymore. We use a central controller that sends information and receives information as a supervisor from devices over the network. This, uh, the, uh, I'll bite the fact that it's important to send and receive messages, is not a showstopper if something happens. So we built the network, we built the communication over standard Ethernet network. 
which is actually quite uh, useful for that type of communication. But would it be possible actually to um, use that very architecture, network architecture that's present to control the units and send audio and transmit audio through that network? But keeping in mind that uh, the, the, the topics we just discussed before, that it needs to be at a very high end quality. Well, within the industry, um, according to us and many other manufacturers, AVB is the foundation of this common solution, if I can say. Uh, AVB is the answer that we want to give to uh, this problematic that we exposed. AVB is the evolution of the Ethernet standards uh, that addresses the, uh, the, the problems that has the standard Ethernet for time-sensitive data. Audio, video, and, and other types of data are time-sensitive data. We need to be ensure we need to assure that uh, the data will pass through the network at a very specific time, at an extremely high uh, path, and they will arrive to all devices that are um, that will emit the signal afterwards at precisely the same time. So AVB is the protocol. That, uh, that is based over Ethernet that will allow us to do that. And above AVB is the Milan. The Milan protocol is actually the common language. It makes sure that every manufacturer that will design uh, Milan certified products will be able to talk to each other, share the same language, understand each, uh, each other language. Means, and by language, we mean here streams of data and be able to uh, uh, cooperate over the same network. It's true that you may have heard about AVB for quite some time now. We cannot uh, hide the fact that it's been, uh, it's had quite a bit of a slow start due to the lack maybe of uh, leading actors. But these leading actors uh, gathered through the past years into uh, under the umbrella of the Avenue Alliance and shared um, a common goal, which is the construction of Milan. So this Milan initiative um, uh, was led by many actors within our industry, such as uh, Al Acoustics, TNB, uh, Mayer Sound, and other um, leader, leading manufacturers of different type of uh, uh, products. So we're talking about uh, console manufacturers, we're talking about audio interfaces manufacturers, AV switches manufacturers, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And actually, um, if we are referencing to uh, AVB, we can also uh, talk about TSN. Some of you may have heard about the uh, about the term TSN. TSN stands for Time Sensitive Networks, and it's the application of AVB on different domains. Domains just such as finance, industrial uh, automation, motion control, or even oil and gas. All those industries actually need to have that time sensitiveness information in, uh, taken into account. We're talking about the past and the present uh, and the future, obviously, but we also uh, we are we are talking about present and a, a little bit of the past, actually, <laughs> because AVB is here for uh, quite some time, and not only here in terms of development, but here, here in terms of applications. We've been using AVB in different types of shows, uh, we as El Acoustics, or we as the entire industry, as you see here are very uh, uh, small examples um, or not extensive examples of the shows that have been running fully on AVB. Uh, in the last years, and uh, we can see that it touches both the touring uh, market, both the installation market for small uh, gigs to very large sized gigs. So that's it about the history and a little bit of the introduction about AVB and Milan. And I will let now Etienne explain why is AVB and Milan our um, common solution to address the present issues that we have in our industries. Okay, thank you, Germain, for the introduction. And uh, now we'll dive a little bit into the, the technical aspects of things. Uh, and first, I think it's good to remember a little bit like what's our standard uh, nowadays for uh, audio distribution. And I think like uh, what we can define as being the standard 
is audio that will travel through typically balanced three-point XLR cable. So in two different ways. First, uh, actually the older way is the analog transmission where you have typically voltage variations that are proportional to the original acoustic wave. And that you, and you have an electrical signal frequency range which equals the audio content. And we have the restriction that this is one channel per cable. And then what we can quote as being the reference these days is digital transmission, typically over ISODU, where we don't use any longer analog audio to be transmitted, but we encode it first into PCM audio data with an embedded media clock, uh, which is the defining, which is the sampling rate at which we have uh, encoded our audio. So this typically ranges from 44.1 to 192 kilohertz for professional applications. The benefit of this is that we already have two channels per cable and not only one. And this can be even like up to 64 channels, typically for extension of ISODU that is known as MADI by using not any longer XLR cables, but coaxial cables or optical fiber. And the other benefits are uh, actually uh, an increased level of quality because uh, this type of transmission is far less, uh, is, uh, is actually uh, more immune to ground loops actually, and to uh, electromagnetic interferences. So we are less disturbed by all of that and we can guarantee a better signal to noise ratio than analog transmission. Now, when we move uh, from this type of transmission, which were actually continuous transmission, so we had a continuous incoming uh, audio signal that was typically originally an analog signal that we can encode to PCM, but still transfer in a continuous manner. As soon as we go into the Ethernet or IP uh, domain, and that concerns all the formats uh, you've heard about uh, related to uh, audio over IP or Ethernet that we are talking about AVD, but we're talking about Dante, we're talking about LS67, we're talking about Ravenna, we're talking about QLAN, all of them share the same basic principle, is that what you need to do from this digital audio is to slice it into smaller parts and to embed it uh, into IP packets. What this means is that when IP packets are then sent through the network, they are sent in a non-continuous manner. It's more like individual packets that will travel through the network within a certain time. And you don't have a warranty when you receive those packets that you can reconstruct a continuous stream automatically. So what you need, what you absolutely need is that each of these packets is timestamped such that you can actually extract the audio information, give a time at which it's expected to be played back at the listener end. And when the listener, the listener receives it on the other side of the network, it knows that it needs to be played at a very precise timing. And by that, reconstruct a continuous audio stream. For that to work properly, we need to make sure that all devices need to agree on the time of the day. And that's what we call the wall clock. The wall clock is really what time it's now, but we're not talking about precision, like in terms of seconds, the travel in terms of nanoseconds. And we want to make sure that all the devices on this network really share that common reference in an extremely precise manner. And uh, we need also to carry uh, the media clock, which is the digital audio clock as it's known today, which will be absolutely uh, necessary as in any digital audio uh, protocol. So that like the, the, the signal at the listener end can be reproduced uh, correctly in again, a continuous manner without any click or small audible degradation because of misalignment of uh, media clocks. So how this works is that typically uh, what will happen is that when a packet is being like sent, it's actually sent to all the devices uh, that will need to play it back. So all the listeners, as we call them, and all the listeners will know by the presentation time. So that's this timestamping information that's in the packet 
that they need to play it at this instant, this time, this time offset to the original time when the packet was created. So we're typically about a small offset, which is in the range of milliseconds. And that's typically two milliseconds in AED in our case. The other thing is how the wall clock, how can we synchronize these wall clocks is typically by electing a grandmaster clock, so a clock to reference, the one that will tell that's the time that it is now, and that this grandmaster uh, will actually propagate the timing information to the other devices in an iterative manner through the network, such that all of them can properly align their clocks. So what can go wrong? I think that's what the question we should always ask ourselves when we describe something is not what's right, but what can go wrong? Because that's what will define actually uh, the quality of what we're doing. So what can go wrong is typically the world clubs don't synchronize themselves perfectly. Why could, what could that uh, actually uh, do to the signal is that if we have some kind of time varying information in the world clock synchronization, we won't be able to reconstruct perfectly those packets and have them perfectly aligned, but typically there will be a small uncertainty and that can result typically in jitter. And jitter is typically noise added to a signal. And if we look at uh, typical figures of uh, what we get uh, through audio over Ethernet, so uh, that's uh, actually rather based on what we get on ASODU, uh, jitter shows up as noise that gets added to a signal. And in that case, so it's a perfect one kilohertz pulse. And we see that in case of really severe jitter, we have a noise that gets added to a signal, but that's at an extremely low level. And so we are talking about minus 120 dB below uh, the, the, the level of the signal. And that's the worst, worst case uh, situation. So in RSOBU, we will more have like uh, in more standard conditions, like minus 140 dB of noise, and that's close to be just inaudible and also almost indetectable. So that's what we are aiming at, actually. What can go wrong next is that we have also, instead of having a varying offset, we have a fixed delay offset, which would be different for multiple listeners. And that can easily happen if we don't have like perfect synchronization and we want to avoid that jitter, we may rather just decide on, a, on an offset and try not to move too much from it. And that's actually quite an issue because when we think about that timing information, that timing information is crucial and critical uh, in, uh, in audio chain and especially in sound reinforcement, in sound reproduction. If we have typically multiple loudspeakers in the same room that would be paired for stereo or multi-channel audio, any offset we might have in the different speakers will result in shifts in image that can be extremely disturbing, especially for some engineers. The other thing that's also problematic is that typically large format or even medium format line sources will be driven by more than one amplified controller. And these amplified controllers receiving like different inputs. And uh, if they are not perfectly time aligned between each other, all the work that was done in the optimization of those line sources with mechanical optimization, electronic optimization might get lost because the different elements are time unaligned. So how this synchronization happens? Actually, it's through a protocol that's called precision time protocol, so PTP. And that's the same basic principle that's applied on all the formats we know. So the idea is that in order to resync uh, the clock between a master device and a slave device, we will send uh, some messages across the network to be able to recall and to understand like the propagation time from one step to another and be able to align the clocks in terms of offset and rate ratio. So the speed at which they go. And this message, this type of message ex uh, exchange work perfectly if the propagation time is constant and perfectly symmetric in one direction to the other. 
And that works really well uh, when you talk about like cables, because the propagation within cables is deterministic. However, as soon as we have some switches, so Ethernet switches in the middle, obviously this will depend on what else is going through the network. So as soon as you have traffic, whatever type of traffic, messages will be placed in queues, uh, might get even a bit stuck in these queues, will take time also to, uh, to get through the switch. And as long as we know how long uh, the, this transfer time within the switch, actually we can do a pretty good job. However, if those switches are not implementing that capability of indicating the time it takes to go through them, then that's a lot of uncertainty. And with more modern versions of PT pro protocols, so that's PTP v2 or even better GPTP that is used for ADD, this is available, but for older protocols that are just based on PTP, and that's the case of Dante, uh, we can have that issue. And uh, PTP v2, so will be shared with all other protocols, basically. So we're talking about QLAN, LS67, uh, or Ravenna for one of them. And uh, they all use that PTP v2 format. But that means that you need to have specific switches. So in order to have PTP v2 available, we're not talking about the everyday switch. We're talking already about specific switches. And these days, most of these specific switches would also have GPTP available inside. So we are presenting here a test that will enable us to be able to really qualify the, the, what we get uh, in terms of uh, quality uh, for that type of, uh, of network for world clock synchronization. And that test has not been done by us. It's been done by Ixia, which is a lab specialized in testing like uh, critical networks and uh, and especially that type of timing information. In this test, that's really a, a stress test where, we, where the time sensitive information is not audio, but it's a video in that case, but that's still perfectly relevant because that's still this type of precision that we are looking for. And video in that case, so, is, uh, so we have six switches that are cascaded and each switch would receive two streams of video occupying each 5% of the bandwidth. And these video streams have to be uh, actually made available at this listener here, which is at the end uh, of the cascade. And what we need to know is that we have as well background information, which actually saturates the switch. So each switch is at pretty much 100% of its capability. And we see that we are building up actually from switches to switches, the amount of time sensitive information that we will carry, ending up with about 60% of uh, video uh, for time sensitive information. And there at the last switch, we're also adding some audio for voice over IP, which ends up at the output link actually saturated to 110%. Okay, that's really a stress test, but that can be a test that uh, conditions that happen in reality. So it's good to, to know what happens in those cases. And when we look at the results, actually it's kind of uh, interesting to see what's going on is that when we look at what happens uh, for PTPv1, so PTPv1 once again being representative of typically Dante network, in that extremely uh, stress test, uh, so not using time aware switches or the time aware functionality of the switches, in this stress test, we can have an error that goes to up to 2.5 milliseconds. And when we look at the data, it's actually oscillating between 1.5 and 2.5 milliseconds of error. Under this test of conditions, when we talk about 2.5 milliseconds, just to give a rough idea of what it represents, it's 240 samples at 96 Ks. And we're not talking about a phase offset, but it's even 24 cycles away at uh, 10 kilohertz, which will be our frequency of reference for, for the rest uh, of the test. However, what's interesting to see is that also when there is no traffic on the network, uh, on the same network, we can still get quite some significant errors. So in the, in the, in the range of 10 microseconds, uh, 10,000 nanoseconds, which is one sample at 96 kilohertz and 36 degree phase shift at 10 kilohertz. So we start to have something 
even without any traffic, that's already kind of significant uh, for our, the audio range. When we look at PTV V2, it's already uh, much better in the sense that we get uh, up to 4.5 uh, nanoseconds under uh, the test conditions. Well, uh, and that's the case at the last hop. So the last hop, meaning the last switch, the one that's closest to the, to the listener. So even though when I'm saying that, it's actually not that, it's at the listener directly that we're evaluating. And uh, we see that the error is building up, actually. When we get through the different switches, we have a buildup of error, which uh, kind of reaches like a maximum at the very end. And that's uh, when we look more precisely at the data, that's more a form of a noise. And those 4.5 microseconds would be more or less plus minus 0.5 samples at 96 kilohertz, or plus minus 16 degrees of phase shift at 10 kilohertz. However, when we look uh, again at GPTP, we see that GPTP gets much more precise actually because we get no more than about 100 nanoseconds. And that's typically uh, the, the, in the range of what we would get in terms of jitter for iOS ODU. So that's about like uh, 45 times or even 70 times more precise than what we get for PTP V2. And, uh, and we see that the time instant, like the smallest time instant uh, for iOS CDU would be 83 milliseconds. So we're in the same range. So we can imagine that the quality we are delivering is at least as good as what we would get in iOS CDU. So if we look in terms of sample, that's plus minus 0.01 sample at 96 kilohertz and plus minus 0.5 degrees of phase shift at 10 kilohertz. So that's really, really small what we get with GPTP. The other thing that we need to sync uh, again will be the media clock. So as any digital audio chain, like we need to make sure that the, the clock between uh, talkers and listeners have, are perfectly in sync. Uh, and that's in this case, the media clock, the clock of the digital audio chain. And uh, we need, and that can be easily reconstructed uh, from the media stream itself, so the stream of audio in that case, where we have indicated uh, actually there are some metadata that indicate this media clock and we can easily reconstruct it at the listener. What's also a possibility in AVB is in the case we have uh, two talkers, actually not AVB but Milan, is that we have a specific uh, stream that can be captured by multiple talkers and that's called the CRF uh, media clock stream. And this CRF stream is perfectly uh, analogous to a word clock in, a digital, uh, in, the, in the digital audio world. So something we're all familiar with already. It's very common to have like a reference uh, digital audio clock that's being distributed to all other elements of the network. And that's possible with this CRF stream that's part of Milan. Now, if we go to the what can go wrong again. Uh, so we were looking into a small offset or, or even like varying offset of the main of the wall clocks. However, what can happen definitely as well is that we can also lose packets uh, and that can be typically uh, traffic related where actually there's too much traffic at some point and, uh, and actually the packets, it's not that they don't arrive, but they may arrive too late because remember that we have this presentation time. So we have a time at which we expect to play the packets. If the packets have not reached the listener, they can't get played. And in order for that to happen, you need to give some kind of priority, especially in saturated network for this time sensitive information. In all formats, but AVB, this is managed through quality of service. So in quality of service, there are actually some level of priorities that are set uh, for different type of, uh, of, uh, of information. And that will try uh, to guarantee that the, uh, the packets arrive in time. And they will, uh, for any other type of traffic, actually it will end up being best effort. So if we look at what can happen, is that in case we would have like, for example, quite a lot of time sensitive data. So let's say audio, that go through a switch as well as control information that would go through 
controller application. This information, actually, the controller information can easily get lost or only a few would go, would go through because there is low priority. So when the switch has to pass certain information, it will highly prioritize the audio data. If we take a little bit more complex uh, scenario where we would have quite a lot of uh, uh, sending devices, so which uh, would be talkers for audio, talkers for video, uh, some control information uh, that needs to go through one switch and then reach a computer, but also reach like this uh, amplified controller here. So that would be computer for video, amplified controller for audio. Same thing can happen, but it can also happen actually that the saturation also occurs for the audio information. So no control data can go through because we just have too much traffic. Uh, and the audio information can get lost as well, meaning lost. So this packet here, uh, audio two, will just never reach its, de its destination. Okay, what will guarantee that, uh, that this is not happening in IDB? is actually two things. First, that's the stream reservation protocol. The stream reservation protocol is something that checks before even starting to send audio or video through the network, so time-sensitive information through the network, that the bandwidth is available for it. So it will reserve up to 75% of the bandwidth, but the up to is very important, meaning that if you're only sending like a few channels of audio, it will be only some percents of the bandwidth that might be reserved and all the rest remains available for other traffic. So it's not because you have AVB on a given network that you will block all the rest. It's not true. Like we're only taking and reserving what is necessary. It's as if on a large highway, you would, maybe with 10 lanes, you would reserve just one uh, for the important information. There are still nine uh, lanes where the cars can go through. Also very important is uh, what we can say as being like some scheduling is that instead of sending like packets through the network without any uh, regularity as can happen in regular ethernet. So basically all formats but ADB, uh, the traffic can actually be transmitted in bursts. So you can have like uh, some burst of information because of the structure of the network. And you can actually uh, from time to time hit the limit and therefore have issues in transmitting packets. What happens in AVB is that instead of doing that, uh, it's all the packets will be sent actually in a very regular manner. And this has two benefits. That means that all the packets will arrive in time because there is no, and they will arrive and they will arrive in time because they are sent in this regular manner. So they won't hit that limit. And that, again, reserves a lot of bandwidth available on top of that for the other traffic. So we are not interfering, again, with the other traffic because we will leave a lot of uh, time instance on the network to transmit those packets. So if we take, again, our, our stress test, but not look any longer at the wall clock uh, information, but rather at the uh, at the packets, how they get uh, received, are they getting lost or are they uh, getting too much delay? Uh, actually, this test was done also in uh, two types of networks, so either one gigabit or 10 gigabit. And what we see is that in AVB, there's no packet loss. So 0% in both cases, like uh, in both type of networks. Remember, it's an overly saturated network again. And all packets, we can say, arrive in time because the maximum latency we can observe per stream is far below uh, what we typically set as a presentation time, which remember is around two milliseconds in our case. So we see that going through all of these switches with this saturated uh, network, like we are far below that time. However, that's not the case uh, for all other type of formats, which would rely on quality of service because we lose packets. So we see that for one gigabit network, it's 5%. For video, that results in degraded quality, but for audio, that's pure dropouts. And that's really something that's not acceptable. And we may also have too much latency for certain packets, which would be well above two milliseconds. 
So we are talking about max latency in the range of 50 uh, milliseconds uh, for a, a one gigabit network, which would be more common in our applications. So the other thing that can go wrong is that you could have pure failure in the infrastructure. So you had one leak that gets broken, just physically broken. And the only cure to that obviously is redundancy. And that's available in most protocols, but also uh, now in Milan, where we have a perfect, like a, a redundant infrastructure that enables to get that, that redundancy with two independent networks. And what's really interesting in the way it's implemented is that when both networks are active, at a given time, the listener will take whatever packets comes from primary and secondary. What this means is that in case we would lose primary network, there will be no dropout in audio. So the transition to the secondary network is just immediate without any ball uh, consequences or audible artifacts. So that's very powerful on its own. So if we just summarize what we get with AVB Milan, uh, we get definitely plug and play uh, network setup. We get an excellent quality, no dropouts or degradation of media as we've been showing through this uh, type of uh, tests. Uh, we have this enhanced redundancy scheme. And as we have this uh, actually reserved uh, bandwidth and also the scheduling of information, we can definitely have control on the same a cable without really conflict. And we can say in the end that users can really fully concentrate on the show and we spend less time in IT uh, thanks to that format. Okay, so that's all for what I had to say uh, on the topic. And now I will hand over uh, to Germain again uh, to go into more uh, of uh, the products and the Milan ecosystem on its own and how it's growing these days. Thank you, Etienne. And indeed, our goal with uh, Milan is to uh, uh, provide the best audio quality, uh, a reliable system, as we uh, spoke a lot in uh, uh, technical terms here. But it's also about uh, giving you a simple and common methodology of deployment and use. And to understand this, let's quickly go through uh, what consists and what composes an AVB network. So we need one or more list, uh, talkers. A talker is the unit that sends AVB streams over the network. We need one or more listeners. The listeners is, are the devices that receive uh, these streams over the network. And depending on the size of the network, we also need bridges or switches, if you will, for um, large deployment or if you want to uh, have a greater interconnect connections or if you want to do redundant schemes. To control all this, we need an AVDEC controller. The AVDEC controller will uh, help you connect streams from talkers to listeners, uh, manage the patching, uh, and get feedback actually from the network. There actually are two certifications for each of these devices. There is one certification for the endpoint, so the talkers and the listeners, and this certification is the Milan certifications. And there is also the certification for the switches. Switches are certified by the IVE Avenue. So they receive the Avenue certification. So basically creating a AVB network composed of Milan certified products and Avenue certified products, uh, makes sure that uh, everything will work very well and, and, and will be sort of automated, if you will. Uh, you will have an automatic discovery of units over your network, an automatic connection of units uh, between each other, uh, which will automatically create the network per se, the AVB network per se. There is also the automatic election of the Grandmaster Clock and so forth and so on. So quite a lot of things are automated and safe and secured as long as you use um, a Milan certified products and Avenue certified switches. At Dell Acoustics, we've uh, grown our product to be Milan certified, and we've grown our product to be Avenue certified for the switches. Uh, you may have followed um, um, some of our latest news that introduced the LS10, which is an Avenue uh, certified AVB switch. It's a 10 port switch that really allows you to connect multiple uh, endpoints. So our endpoints are the P1, 
as the talker and the listener as well, as a matter of fact. And also um, our range of amplified controllers, LA4X, LA12X, and LA2XI. All these elements uh, on their own can create an AVB network, send streams over this network, and be able to uh, interconnect with each other via just uh, CAT5 or CAT6 cables. To control all this, uh, we've integrated an AVDEC controller into LA Network Manager. So quite simply, uh, if you're used to using uh, um, an acoustics product, you basically don't have to change anything to your current setup, um, connecting LA Network Manager to your P1, connecting the P1 to your amplified controllers uh, through an LS10 if you have a larger network. Um, will create automatically the IVB network and you will be able to, to send and the control data, but also the audio data through that network. You have a lot of information on our website on such matters. Um, but we, we're not the only one, if you will, using AVB, and, and you'll see that more and more are coming to using AVB. Um, and many times will happen where uh, we will have units, uh, we'll have devices from various manufacturers trying to interoperate uh, together. And to manage a large number of, this source of these devices, we need an um, overall controller uh, which has the capability, which has the feature, uh, the adequate features in terms of uh, advanced diagnostics, in terms of uh, configuration uh, features, in terms of patching, uh, to be able to manage all these uh, devices. And this is Hive. Hive is an open platform that you can use, as I say, to control all uh, your AVB network from very small networks to very large networks. Um, if you want to have a look at it, uh, you can download it from the, uh, from the link that you see on the slide here. Um, I'm sure some of you will uh, be already familiar with such a, uh, um, such a layout for a software and uh, that you would be up and running in no time using Hive. The community of AVB um, is actually growing these days. Um, many major uh, leaders within our industry, and I'm thinking of the industry as a quite large uh, market, I would say, um, have joined the uh, Avenue Alliance. The Avenue Alliance is the, the, this community of manufacturers from different industries uh, under which the AVB protocol and the Minan protocols are developed, uh, communicated, and publicized. Actually, there's quite a lot of information about uh, both the community of AVB and Milan, uh, about AVB itself and Milan itself on the avenue.org website, but also on the uh, AVB and Milan forum that has been created to answer many of uh, many questions that people may have. So don't hesitate to go on the, these two websites to have a bit more information. And talking about having uh, quite a lot of useful information is actually um, the BIOMP website is um, also a good, um, a good um, place to hunt for AVB information. And they have um, an expensive list of AVB capable Ethernet switches on their uh, website. Um, uh, this list is, keeps on growing. Huh? You may have seen it from uh, some months ago. It was much shorter and now it's become um, longer and longer by as the month pass. Uh, but something that we like to recommend and remind you is to really focus on uh, uh, Avenue certified AVB switches. Um, it will just ensure that you won't face any um, communication and interoperation issues whenever you create your AVB network, especially in complex installations. Um, they're actually quite uh, uh, important news uh, that has been out lately and um, uh, I would note uh, I would like to highlight three of these uh, news uh, that appeared throughout the Avenue Alliance. The first one is coming from Avid. Uh, Avid, which is a, a leader in our in our industry in terms of uh, console manufacturer, has just announced their Milan uh, card for the SXL consoles. The MLN 192 card uh, actually gives you superbly quick access through CAT5 or CAT6 cables 
uh, from the AVB streams of the console and send them directly to front-end processors um, from like the P1 from an acoustics or any other processors that is Milan certified. So that's a huge step uh, into the uh, Avenue, uh, the um, Avenue community. Another great uh, moment uh, for us lately is the introduction of the Milan audio module by Nutric. Uh, it's a module that is called Mina, Minea. It's a Milan audio module that has two inputs, two streams in input and two streams in the output, and that will uh, basically allow uh, manufacturers of different devices uh, to incorporate Milan into their, pro into their product. Uh, products like you know, amplified controllers, uh, loudspeakers, microphones, uh, uh, set up mixing desk, maybe conferences systems. Um, all that will be able to incorporate very simply a uh, Milan module right into their product. This module will be available in, uh, 20, in Q1 of uh, 2021. And the latest news uh, is actually that this joining the club of uh, the Avenue Alliance will, uh, will be easier than, uh, than before. Initially, if you will, there were two levels of commitment to become uh, part of the Avenue Alliance. You can be uh, an Avenue promoter, or you could be an Avenue adopter. Now, uh, a third level of entry uh, called Milan Associates has been created. And uh, while well, the two first uh, levels uh, are quite important commitments uh, because it gives you uh, also a, a quite high presence uh, into the Avenue community um, and decision possibilities, of course, uh, into uh, the protocols that are developed. Um, but the new Milan uh, associate memberships gives you a uh, sort of a lower cost uh, pass to certifying and uh, re registering your uh, Milan products. Uh, being part of that Milan associations has three main advantages. Uh, first, I would say in terms of community, will increase help increases the number of uh, Milan certified products and will um, support the Milan ecosystem as a whole. Uh, second, it um, allows the uh, manufacturers to, um, uh, to facilitate the certification process, if you will, um, if they have implemented the Milan audio module into their product. And, uh, and third, uh, which is quite important aspect, it gives a lower cost entry level to, uh, to the membership of Avenue, uh, within the Avenue Alliance and lower the entry cost to about $1,000 uh, per year. So that's a very um, uh, interesting and uh, reinforcing aspect of, for manufacturers who really want to join the Avenue Alliance and be part of that uh, you know, uh, future developments uh, and to be part of this overall community of companies that are willing to make our, uh, our um, future brighter, if you will or clearer, if we say. So with this um, latest announcements, um, we really believe that uh, we'll see a lot of enthusiasm from uh, manufacturers within our industry and um, we'll be happy to uh, join forces with these manufacturers if they will. That's it for today. Uh, thank you uh, everyone for, the, for uh, listening to our presentation. Uh, hopefully this brought you quite a, um, a handful of information about AVB, Milan, implementation and, um, and membership. Uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask them and um, I will uh, join hands with uh, Etienne to thank you everyone and uh, see you next time. Yep. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone.